In this video, we'll talk about the top 12 mistakes that junior React developers make when it comes to the use state and use effect hooks in React. Number 12, let's say we have a simple counter component here. I have a simple button here on the page and it's showing us the count is count. When I click the button, we have handle click and that's going to set the count to count plus one. And that looks like this and it works as expected. Now, what if you do this? So I'm duplicating the line here because let's say we want to do it again. Right after this, we want to do it again. The expectation now is that it will increase by two when we click. So let me refresh here for a clean slate. I'm going to click. We don't see an increase of two. We actually see an increase of one still. And no matter how many times I add this and refresh here, if I click here, you will see it does not increase by anything more than one. Every time I click, it still increases by one and not by four as you would expect maybe. Because when you set the count, this is basically scheduling a state update. So in this line, we're scheduling that sometimes in the future, React will update the count. So then when you go to the next line, it's not like this count variable has already updated. This one has been scheduled and this one will also schedule schedule some update in the future, but it's still using that same count variable. So if I first load the page here, initially this is going to be zero and this will also be zero. If we click on the button now, this count is simply zero. So it's going to be zero plus one and the result of that is one and it will be scheduled in the future. So when we get to this line, count is still zero. It isn't one yet, so it's still zero. So this will also schedule the count to be one in the future. When we get to this line, count is still zero. It hasn't been updated yet and the same for this. So they're all going to set count to one. So if I save here, you can see if I click once, the count is simply becoming one. And therefore it doesn't become four as you would expect on the first click. The solution here is to use the updater function version of updating the state. So with use state, you can also update like this with a function. If you do it with a function, you get the previous value as the argument. You can use that previous value now instead of count. We can just say, take the previous value and increment it by one. This previous value is actually up to date. So if you schedule something, you basically can get access to that here in the next line as long as you use that updater function. So this is the most up-to-date value of that count variable. So if we do it this way, if I now save here and refresh the page, now if I click, you can see it increments to four. If I click again, it increases to eight and it increases by four every time I click. Now, some people have taken this lesson and think that you should always update the state with this updater function. And that's not entirely true. You can still update like this. There's nothing inherently wrong with updating like this. However, in this case, when you have multiple set counts, you may want to use that updater function. And in all other scenarios, essentially, you can still use this. You'll see another example of this later in the video. Number 11, conditional rendering. Let's say we have some kind of product card and in the props, we get the ID. So this component is responsible for taking some ID and just rendering the relevant product card for that ID. Now it's possible, of course, that the ID doesn't get passed wherever it's used, it doesn't pass the ID. So in that case, we could simply return no ID provided, right? So then you don't get to this part, right? Because we already used the return keyword there. So it returns out of the function, right? Component is just a function in React. As soon as you have the return keyword, you stop there. It doesn't continue to here. So here, the only thing we're doing here is just returning a string no ID provided. So that's what we see. The problems here will start if you try using hooks after that if block. So maybe we do use state here and we'll just say something set something blah, blah. And maybe you want to do a use effect. I will talk more about use effect, but you could do something like this. We have the use state hook and the use effect hook, and we got red squiggly lines. That's never good. So let's take a look. React hook use state is called conditionally. It needs to be called in the exact same order every component render. And we get the same problem with use effect here. So the problem is that sometimes this ID may not exist, and therefore we already return out of the function here. However, sometimes the ID may exist. Actually, most of the time it does exist. And then we actually do use use state and use effect here they will actually be invoked and that's not allowed in react so this invocation of the hooks always needs to be the same in every render so you could simply do it like this simply do it after the hooks now i get an error here because i should import this so let me quickly do that i will import both of them now i'm using next.js here and these days we have client and server components we'll talk more about that in this video as well essentially you cannot use use state and use effect in server components so i have to make this a client component and don't worry we'll talk more about this later so now you can see all the errors are gone and this still works. Now, as a matter of style, I don't like to have these two returns in my component function. So I would refactor this a little bit differently. So I would do it in one return here and I would do something like if no ID, then I would say no ID provided. And otherwise, if there is an ID, I would simply render the product card there, right? So I would prefer to do something like this. So then we can get rid of this and this will work the exact same. But I think it looks better to only have one return keyword. Number 10, incorrectly 
updating an object state. So sometimes you're gonna have an object in your state. So let's say we have this object here. It has a name, property, city, and age. And there can be other things in this form. Let's say we just have one input for now. And of course, when we start typing here, when I say Tim, for example, I wanna actually update the state here to be that name. So what you can say is on change. So every time there is a change in that input field, run the function handle change. So let's quickly create that function here, handle change. So we have this event. And here when we try to update the object, we may do a couple of things wrong here. So we cannot just say something like user.name is e.target.value, right? So basically this is gonna be Tim and we're gonna assign that to user.name, but this will not work. So let me log the user here so we can actually see what it will be. So I'm gonna console log the user. You can see when I save here, we can ignore these warnings. It's just gonna be an object with name empty still. So now I'm gonna type something. And now you can see when I type, we actually get errors. So this doesn't work and you may think oh yeah of course because we actually need to return an object here right this is an object so let's make this an object and in that object we have a name and we should simply set that name to e.target.value right so whatever we put in the input field so if i save here and now if i try typing here let's see what we get and let me add console log again so i'm logging the user object and let me refresh here for a clean slate okay so you can see initially we have this object and now if i start typing you can see we get an object again and it has the name correctly as well but then it doesn't have the city and age properties right so our object here should have name but also city and age and when you do it like this this is a common mistake you are not copying over the city and age properties so what you want to do here is you can take the user object here that we have and you can just spread that out over here this will copy all of those properties including name into this new object that we're passing to set user but then we have this name after that so this will over write that so if we do this and now let me refresh for a clean slate this is the initial object and now if i start typing you can see our object has the same properties with the updated name so this is the correct way of updating one property in an object here we are using this user variable here in practice you do see a lot of people use the updater function here it's not necessary but a lot of people seem to do it we can get the previous value of user and instead of using user we can just use brief here i get some strange issue with typescript here we can ignore that but this is also a common syntax. When we do this, you have to pay attention to how you're returning something here. So here it's a function now. So now when you have the first curly brace, that's not going to be the opening curly brace of an object. This is going to be the opening curly brace of a function block. So here, what you can do is you can wrap it in parentheses. So then you don't have to use the return keyword. So here, everything in the parentheses, that's what you will return. So you can write it like this and the errors will disappear, or you can actually write the return keyword here. So then you would go into the function block itself and then have a an actual return statement here and we would return an object here with these things in there right so now it looks a bit strange with all these curly braces and parentheses right so really make sure you've mastered javascript itself check out the javascript course in the link oh, this is another way of doing the same thing number nine let's say you have a form with a lot of inputs so we have first name last name email passwords in the real world you can have forms with dozens of inputs and we want to keep state of all of that so let's say we have first name here and now a beginner may say oh we also need one for last name and email and password basically create a separate state for all of them and that's not what we want to do it's cleaner to just use one object here for the whole form so you can have an object as state and then it would just be let's say form set form and then in the form you would have a key for each input so first name maybe empty initially last name email password address zip code right so just use one big object for all of that now if you want to update this it's actually very easy you can just use one function so if i want to type here and this first name should get updated we've seen that you can use on change we want to run a function called handle change which we're going to define here handle change all right and then we can just update that so we can say set form and we've seen how this works now right so now we want to update one property in an object so it should be an object that we have here we can spread the form here so we get all the contents of that form here and then we can overwrite something so here we want to overwrite first name with whatever we put here and then we can get that from e.target.value right so now this first name will get properly updated here in the form in practice you're going to see this updater function format as well for this so here when you want to return something you do need to wrap it in parentheses or you need to use that return keyword like we saw before and then we can use previous instead of the form right so this is pretty common to see so now we have this we're setting a new object here we copy everything over from the form first and then we over write the first name in this case now that's
that's only the first name. What if I type something from my last name here? What we want to be able to do is just copy this for all the other ones as well. And we can actually do that. This is the best way to update. So now I added this to last name. If I type here, it's going to fire this function. It's going to set the first name here. That's not what we want. It should become last name. So how do we solve this? Well, these inputs, they also have a name attribute. So here the name is first name, name is last name, name is email, name is password. These names are the exact same as what we have in the object for the keys here. So what we can use is actually, instead of hard coding first name here, there is something else that we get in this event variable, which is e.target.name. And we can use that for the object key here that we want to override. And you can actually write this in JavaScript like this. So you have square brackets, and then you can just use e.target.name, right? So if I type here, we're going to run the handle change function. Well, this one has a name of first name. So this will simply become first name, and it will get the value that I type here. And now if I type here, the second one with last name as a name, this one simply becomes last name with the value that I type here. So that will properly update this part, right? So now we can simply use this handle change for all of the inputs here, right? So I can add it to all of them like this. Right, and if you want to use the update a function here, it works the exact same. You just make this a function, and now the opening curly brace with functions is going to be like the opening of the block. So we need to wrap this in parentheses if we want to return this, or we actually want to go in here and use the return keyword like we saw before. Right, and then you would use previous to spread the previous value here and then override it like this. But I prefer this syntax. We don't need the previous value here. All right, number eight. Let's say we have some kind of cart, and this cart is keeping track of the quantity. And every time I click this button, Button, we run the function handle click which just increases the quantity by one right very straightforward now let's say we want to show the total price here as well so we need to keep track of the total price here so a beginner may think oh i'm going to type i'm going to write a new state here so total price set total price and maybe we can say something like initially zero and then every time we update the quantity we want to update the total price so you may think oh i'll use a use effect right so here we can say use effect we want to run this function every time the quantity changes. So you have a dependency array, and every time this quantity variable changes, we want to run this function. In that function, we can set the total price to, well, what, what is going to be the total price? Well, that's always quantity times the price per item. So now what we have is every time I click here, we run this function and it will update the quantity, which means that this user fact now will also run and it will set the total price. Right? It makes sense logically when you think about it like that. And now we can just output this on the page. The total price is going to be something. So now we have one initially, and this will also run initially. So it's going to be one times five is five. If I click again, it's going to add another five, right? Because quantity updates, quantity becomes two and two times five is 10. Every time I click, it increases by five. Five. All right, so this is very bloated and this is not necessary at all. So here, if we want to know the total price, we don't need to use use state or use effect, right? We can just remove that. I will comment this out because we can derive it from the quantity and the price per item. So here you can just create a variable in your function body. There's no, you can do that. And you can say the total price, this is going to be a variable total price. And that's going to be the quantity times the price per item, right? You can do this, of course. If I save here and start from a clean slate, if I now click, it still works the exact same same because what happens is initially when it first renders this component it will go in the function body here line by line the quantity will be one it's going to do one times price per item which we have set as five so then here total price is five then if i click handle click this function will run it will update the quantity which will re-render this component so we will go into the function body again this time quantity will be two because we added one and then we run this line again this statement so it will be two times the price per item which is 10 so now total price is 10 and it will be output on the page right so you can see that you don't need all these hooks every time if you can derive it or calculate it from already existing states you don't need to create new states and use use effects another typical example of this is for example if you have the first name of somebody right so we have first name and then maybe also keeping track of the last name right and now you want to know the full name so you think oh well full name well we're just going to create a new use state for that and for full name and that's not necessary we can derive it from already existing states right so you can say full 
name, well that's simply the first name plus the last name. Right? No state, no use effect needed. Every time one of these updates, the function will re-render and it will go statement by statement again. So every time the full name will get updated as well. Right? So very typical junior developer mistake. All right, number seven, primitives versus non-primitive values. Let's say we have a price component and we just have a simple button here. And when we click the button, we run a function called handle click, which we have defined here. And the only thing it does is set the price to zero every time. Right? So initially it's zero and this one is also going to set the price to zero. Now you probably learned that if the state doesn't change the component doesn't re-render right? rendering a component just means in the function body we just run all the statements again so we just run the entire thing again so let's see if that's actually true let's just log something at the start of the component here component rendering so we're going to log this and i'm going to open up the dev tools console here i'm going to clear everything here so now if i click this button let's see what happens so now if i load the page and this component first mounts we see component rendering right so when it first mounts it's going to run all the statements in the function body here so we indeed log this now if i click again and i keep clicking you can see it doesn't say component rendering again because here it can see that this is the same value as it already is right so it won't re-render the component and that is true if you have a number or a string so now if i try to set it to an, a string called test now i'm keeping the state a string called test restart here from a clean slate now if i click again you can see it doesn't re-render same with a boolean so if i set it to true and i set the price to true whenever I click the button let me restart again now I'm going to click here you can see no re-rendering however what if we actually have an object here this may actually describe the price so it may have um, a number for the price let's say 100 and it may also have some kind of a boolean in there so total total price true right so now the price variable here is an object with these two properties and what happens if we set the price to an object with the exact same properties and values so I'm going to copy this I'm going to save here and refresh here for a clean slate so now what happens is whenever i click you can see the component re-renders why is that because you think when you look at this visually speaking it looks the exact same right? i didn't make a typo or anything right it's the exact same state you would say and why is it re-rendering well that's because in javascript there are primitive values that we just saw that are passed by value and the objects and arrays are passed by reference so if i have a variable a that's the number five let's say and i have a variable b that is also the number five if i say a is strictly equal to b javascript tells me that's true if i have a variable called c with the string test and a variable d with the string test if i say c is strictly equal to d javascript will tell me that's true however what if we now have an object so let's say i have an object y and i have a key of hello is, is one let's say so this is an object and now i also have another object which also has hello is one and it's the exact same right you would say so now i'm going to write y is strictly equal to z and javascript is telling me that's false because in javascript whenever you write an object literal like this you're not actually working with the object itself you're working with a reference a pointer and this is a bit tricky to understand but what you need to know is that this is not the actual value that you're working with you're working with an address and the address for this object is going to be different from the address of this object so an object is more like a box in the real world you can have one box with the exact same contents as another box but there are two different boxes right an object may have the exact same contents as another object has the exact same contents here but they're still two different objects and that's not true with strings and numbers and booleans so they are always the exact same you actually work with their actual value here you work with their reference so here what happens is we have this object here and when we click we're setting it to this object and this is a different object right? and react will see oh you're passing something new here this is different from what we had before because it's a different object and therefore for react will say well it's different so we're going to re-render that's why when i click here it keeps re-rendering in practice this is mostly dangerous for when you have some kind of dependency array most commonly with use effect the way it works is you're going to run this function every time what you specify here in the dependency array so if you have it empty it's just going to run only once when it first mounts but you can also specify a variable here like price and now every time price changes this function will run as well now you want to be careful with this because this object is going to change every time you update it so typically you don't want to depend on an object you want to depend on a primitive value like a number boolean string so you can also just look at the contents of the object so you can say price that number so now you're just depending on a primitive which will prevent this use effect function from unnecessarily running number six initializing state with an object so let's say we have some kind of blog post component and here we have the post and we can set the post and here we have a use effect 
fact. So use a fact, the way it works is we have this function here and with the dependency array, we determine when it should run. So an empty dependency array means it's only gonna run when it first mounts. When the component mounts, it's gonna fetch the post. Eventually it gets a response. It will parse that response as JSON, meaning it will convert it from JSON to a normal JavaScript object so we can work with that. That's gonna be data here. And that's what we're gonna set the post as. And this can take some time, can take multiple seconds. But here we are already rendering post.title, post.body. So if I save here, let's actually see what we get. So here you can see, I get an error because initially it says something about cannot read properties of undefined. So we have post.title, but post.title is undefined because I haven't specified an initial value here. Right? So initially post is gonna be undefined. So here immediately you're gonna to try to do undefined.title and that's not possible, you're gonna get an error. Right? And also remember the use effect runs after rendering. So first you try to render this on the page and then after that use effect runs. Right? So make sure you've mastered the React fundamentals, check out my React Next.js course. So while we're waiting for this to finish and we actually have the post data, we are already trying to access post.title. So post is initially undefined and if you try to access something on undefined in JavaScript, you're gonna get this error. So one way around this is to use optional chaining. So we're basically saying post may not exist, it may be undefined. So if we try to access something, don't throw an error. So if I save here, we don't get an error and now we actually get the data as well. Now typically people initialize this not with undefined or leaving it empty. It's better to make it explicit that it's initially null. And in JavaScript, if you want to mark something explicitly as not existing, you use null. Undefined is more accidentally not existing, essentially. Null is when you are really deliberate about it. So here we are deliberate. Initially, it's empty, right? So for the empty state, initially, it should be null. So initially, it's going to be null. And then we can try accessing title and body. And it works the same way here. So if I remove this, initially, we're going to get an error because title, you cannot access dot title on null. So we could do this optional chaining thing. We could do this, but a cleaner solution is to use some kind of a loading state. So what we want to do is simply not render anything until we actually have the data from the post, right? That makes much more sense. So what we can do here is we can have something like loading. If it's true, we may just want to say nothing or maybe loading dot dot dot. And otherwise, if it's not loading, we actually want to display this title and body. Here we do actually want to display the title and body. So I'm going to put this in a React fragment because I don't want to clutter up the markup with divs or anything. We don't need a div. Okay, so then we have loading and then we can just have a state for loading. So we can check if it's still loading. So we can say loading initially is true, right? And then here it starts fetching that and eventually it has received the data and we can set loading, set loading to false, right? So we can do this. So now let's see what we get. If I save here, the error should disappear. We get a loading state and then we get the nice post, right? So this is a much cleaner solution. Now you don't really want to fetch yourself in use effect. And we'll talk more about this later in the video. So keep watching. Number five, a very typical TypeScript mistake in React. You don't have to understand TypeScript right now. This will be a good introduction. So you can see my file now is called .tsx. Previously, I had JSX. This is plain JavaScript. In TSX, you can use TypeScript. Now, when you do that, and we take the, the previous example, remember we had this post. Initially, the post is null. So post is going to be null. And here in rendering, we also have loading state. So here, if it's loading, we just want to render loading. And then here, we're, we're fetching the data. When the component first mounts, it's an empty array. So only once when it first mounts, it will fetch the post. And eventually, when we get the response, we set the post to that data and we also set loading to false. So here, when loading is false, the post has been fetched and we want to display the title and body. Now, previously, we didn't get any red squiggly lines, but now when I enable TypeScript, we see these red squiggly lines. So TypeScript is giving us a warning here, essentially, and it's saying post is of type null. And that's because with TypeScript in React, if you're using state here, TypeScript can infer what the type of this variable is going to be. So for loading here, for example, if I hover loading, TypeScript is telling me loading is going to be of type boolean. How does it know that? I have not specified this myself. I could specify it myself. And the way you would specify it is with these weird looking angled brackets. You could say this loading state, let me make this wider. This loading state is going to be of type boolean. So we're going to see loading as boolean, but TypeScript could already infer that. So we don't need to do that. And so TypeScript can infer from the initial value that you pass in what type it's going to be. So if you have text here, for example, initially that may be a string, right? Now I could specify string here. I could tell TypeScript, hey, this variable here, text is going to be of type string, but I don't need to do that because TypeScript can see this. Oh, this is going to be a string. So if I hover this, you can see it has already been inferred as a string. By the way, what's the benefit of this? Okay. So TypeScript knows that text is going to be a string. So what? If TypeScript has the correct type here for a string, TypeScript can then help us out. So here, let's say in the rendering here, I'm trying to do something with text. So I can try
apply to uppercase. Right? I can try to uppercase it. And TypeScript will not give me a warning because it knows that to uppercase is indeed a method that you can use on a string. However, if I try doing this on loading, the loading variable, which is a boolean, right? TypeScript has inferred this to be a boolean. If I try to do something like to uppercase, TypeScript will tell us that this to uppercase does not exist on this type, right? So TypeScript will help us out if we or somebody on our team makes a mistake. And also when we try setting the state here, let's say set loading, if I try to make this, for example, a string false, TypeScript will help us out and will say, well, you cannot assign a string because this loading is supposed to be a boolean, right? So here we're trying to assign a string here, right? A string happens to be false. By correctly typing things, we get these guardrails from TypeScript, right? And the same with count, for example. So these are all primitive values, right? Maybe count initially is the number 100. I could specify that count is going to be of type number, but I don't need to. If I leave this up, TypeScript can look at the initial value and see, oh, this is going to be of type number, right? So here count is going to be of type number. TypeScript can automatically infer that when you use a primitive value like a Boolean string or number. That's not the case when you have these objects. So here with objects, initially we want to have null, but later we know that it's not going to be null. We're actually going to set it to some data. And this is quite common when you have some fetching in your component. So how do we type this then? Because initially it's going to be null. So if I hover post now, you can see TypeScript has inferred this to be of type null. And if it's of type null, you cannot access title and body on post. So now we actually do need to specify what type it's going to be. So we have these built-in types like string and number and boolean, but we can also create our own type. So we can say eventually this is going to be of type post. And so now we need to create that type. So we have type and we can call it post. We can say that's going to be an object. So we have curly braces, it's going to be an object. And let's see, it's going to have a title and body. So we say that the there's going to be a title and that's going to be of type string. It's also going to be a body and that's also going to be of type string. And you could have other things here. Maybe this post has tags, for example, and maybe it's an array of strings. So we can have string and then you can have the array symbol. And now you're saying these tags are going to be an array of strings, right? And we have number, boolean, etc. So now we're telling TypeScript this post variable is going to be of type post. And now it knows it's going to be of type post and post has title and body. So now we can safely access title and body. You can see we, are, we don't have red squiggly lines anymore. But now we get red squiggly lines here under null. So what's going on here? Well, this is because we are telling TypeScript this post is going to be of this type. But now what we're passing in is null. So now it's saying, hey, you told me that it's going to, it's going to be an object with title and body, but what you're giving me here is null. And that's simply because it's the initial value. So typically what you want to do here is you can say it's going to be of type post or null. So it could be null here initially, but eventually it's going to be of type post. And so TypeScript looks a bit strange. We have these angled brackets and this looks a bit confusing. We talk a lot about TypeScript in my React and Next.js course as well. And so don't worry if you're not completely comfortable with this. I will just use it from now on so you can learn a little bit about it. Number four, not using custom hooks. So junior React developers seem to be a little bit confused or scared to use custom hooks. So as an example, I just have one component here and I have another component here, right? You can have multiple components in the same file. That's not a problem. All right, now let's say that this component needs to know the width of the window. So it could create a state for that. So window size, set window size, and maybe initially it's going to be 1920. And let me import this. And we're using use state here. So I need to make this a client component. We'll talk about that in a second. And this state here for window size, we're going to keep track of that in use effect. So use effect, we want to run this function, but only initially when the component first mounts. And let me import this. And in this function, we're simply going to attach an event listener to the window object. So whenever it resizes, we want to update this state. So it's going to be this function that we want to attach. So here, this function will run every time there is a resize event. Now we'll talk more about this, but these use effects, they also have a so-called clean up function. Because when this component unmounts, for example, maybe we're navigating away and this component should not be visible anymore, this event listener is still attached to the window. And we want to remove that when this component is not being used. So in React, you can also return a function here. So this function will run when you unmount your component. And in this function, we can simply remove this event listener. And so it's a clean up function. Basically, we need to clean up our mess basically before we completely remove this component. It's not so important to know the inner details of how all of this works. The important point here is that this is actually a quite common scenario. You have some state and you update it in use effect. And this is a lot of code. Now, very commonly, other components will want the same information. So let's say that example component two also wants this code. So a naive React developer, junior React developer would simply duplicate all of this. They would also put all of this code in those other components. So now we're going to bloat up all our other components that need access to that as well. Very duplicative code now. Now, if you've learned JavaScript properly, 
properly, you may have heard of the dry principle, don't repeat yourself. So whenever you have some kind of repetition, it's, it's a good candidate for refactoring it into something that's a little bit more reusable. And that's the same when you use hooks in React. So here we can create a custom hook out of this. And that sounds very fancy, but it's just refactoring this into a separate sort of utility function or helper function, essentially. So let's see how we can do that. So we can simply create that right here. So we can just create a function. Now, typically the name of these start with the word use to indicate that it will have React hooks in it. Right? Use window size, let's say. You can give it any name you want, but this makes the most sense, I think. And then we're just going to put all of this code in there. So we're going to remove it from this component. We're going to refactor it into one function here. Now we can remove it from this component and we can also remove it from this component. Right? No need to duplicate ourselves. We're just going to refactor it into one function, just like you would do otherwise in JavaScript if you have some kind of repetition. It's the same in React. The only difference is basically that you add the word use in front of it because you're using use state and use effect in there. So this helps indicate that you're using these React features under the hood, right? And then you can just use that here. So you can say use window size. You can just call that function and it will basically run as the exact same as what we had before. And I can add it here as well, right? So now this is much cleaner looking in the components. Now in the components, we wanted access to the window size. So now we do need to return the window size from this function. So let's return window size. And then we can just grab that here when we invoke it, window size. So this would be the complete example. So here I would also add that. So now we get access to the window size in these components, but the code has been refactored into one function that we can reuse so that we don't bloat up our component with repetitive code. All right, so don't be afraid to create custom hooks. We talk a lot about this in my React Next.js course as well. Number three, these days we have server and client components in React. If you're using Next.js, you may have already seen them. If you're using Feed or Create React App, you may have not seen them yet. But this is basically the future of React. So we need to know a little bit about how it works in relation to these hooks. So I'm using Next.js and specifically I'm using the app directory in Next.js. And by default, your components are server components. And that means they're only going to run on the server. Now on the server, they will not keep track of state. So if you try using use state here, if I try doing this, and even if I import it here, if I save here, I get an error. Basically, I cannot use this in a server component. I need to convert this into a client component. I can do that by adding use client at the top. Now, before I do that, let me show you some other things that also don't work. So use effect also doesn't work. So this is a sort of a life cycle hook and you cannot do that on the server, right? So use effect will not work even if I import this, right? So here we get the same error. So the other hooks in React also don't work here. Another thing that doesn't work is, for example, if you do anything with the window object. So for example, alerting does not work on the server, right? So on the server, we don't have access to that window object. So here we're going to get something like window is not defined because there is no window on the server. This has nothing to do with hooks, but I just want to show you this. Also, for example, local storage, right? If we try to do some get item, local storage does not exist on the server. It only exists in the browser. Same from the window. That's a browser feature and the browser gives that to us. So this is not going to be available on the server. It's not going to be defined. So whenever you need access to these client side features, you need to make this a client component. There are two ways of doing that. You can add use client at the top or not use this, but you can import it into another component that is already a client component. For example, if another component has use client at the top, if you import into that other component, this will automatically also become a client component. So you can imagine a tree of components in React. As soon as you add use client to some component, all the other components that you imported there will also become client components. So this is basically like a boundary in your React tree. From now on, everything here becomes a client component. This is also something that we talk much more about in my React Next.js course. Number two, still closure. So let's say we have some kind of counter component and it's just showing us count is count and we're keeping track of the count in this use state. So far, so good. Now let's say that every one second, we want to increment this count by one. So we can set up a set interval when this component first mounts. So that's a lifecycle thing. So we can use use effect. So we can say we want to run this function, but only when this component first mounts. Input this. So this function will run when the component first mounts. And in there, we want to set up an interval as it's called in JavaScript. So what we can do is we can say set interval and here we can say run this function every one second, right? So the first time this component mounts, we're going to set up this interval that will make this function run every one second, right? So what do we want to do in there? Well, maybe we just want to log interval function running. And of course, what we want to do is we want to set the count to count 
plus one. All right, so let's save here and see what we get. So now we can see that the number has increased to one, but it stays there. Why doesn't it keep increasing? It should increase every one second. Let's check if we can see the console log in the console tab. So if I refresh here, we start from scratch and we can see that the interval function is actually running. You can see here that this interval function keeps going. So every second, this function is indeed running. All right, so this function is actually running every second because we can see that this log, well, we can see this every second it does indeed lock that right so if you keep locking the same thing in the console tab the browser will just increment this it's not going to put everything here right but the count for some reason stays at one how is this possible this has to do with a closure in javascript so here initially count is zero the first time we mount this component count is zero and then we're going to run the use effect so this function this whole function will run once when the component mounts and then we're going to run use effect and in the use effect we are setting up this interval function so basically this function will run every one second but javascript will not recreate the function every one second so it will just create this function once and then it will just execute that function every one second and in javascript these variables if you use a variable like count those are created at function creation time and at the time of creating this function count is zero right so this function is only created once and then it's just executed every one second but you can see here that in set count if you make the addition here it becomes one so this is created one time and then it's just doing set count is one every single time that's why you can see that interval function running well we can see that right so this confirms to us that it is actually running every one second but set count is just going to be one all the time so yeah it's just going to stick there right and this is a very tricky mistake that some junior react developers make right so that's called closure the variable is getting the value at function creation time and that's going to be zero simply so how do we make sure that that is updated so that every one second it gets access to the new value well we need to make sure that every one second that function is actually destroyed and then recreated again so that in the new creation of that function it can simply get the new value well maybe we can add count to this array right so you could say we should just add count to this dependency array now use effect will run not only when we mount the component but also whenever this count variable changes so initially it's going to set this to zero plus one right which means that count will change count will be one count has changed so now we're going to recreate this function and count will be one one plus one is two right so then it should work so let's save here and see what we get i'm going to refresh for a clean slate so now we can see zero one two three four and it was a weird hiccup and there we have some more hiccups and now it's getting really strange so now we get a really strange result here where it's sort of spazzing out this simply doesn't work and the reason is that we are not canceling the previous intervals right so now whenever count changes we're simply adding another interval right so now every one second we're just adding another interval so this is going to go completely wrong yeah so you can see it's completely out of whack now so what we need to do is not only create a new interval we also need to cancel the previous one so set interval actually returns an identifier we can call it identifier or just i and we can use that to cancel this one so we use effect also has a so-called clean up function so you can return a function here and this function will run when you unmount the component well that's not the case here but it also runs before running the next use effect call so basically you can clean up something from the previous use effect run so what we can do here is we can cancel that interval from the previous run we can call clear interval and we pass the identifier like this if i save here and we go back refresh now let's see if we get a normal result we see one two three four five six and this seems to work right we don't get any strange effects here right so this looks very tricky we have these inner functions so it's really important that you have mastered the javascript fundamentals right so i see a lot of people jump into react with a lot of enthusiasm but make sure you've mastered like javascript and also css now there is actually a cleaner solution than this so we don't need to do all of this so let me remove this we can remove all of this again also this so we can actually just create this function once it will work but we have to do the set function a little bit differently here so here we need to depend on the previous value right so what we can also do is simply do this so whatever the previous value is just increment that by one right and this will also always be the most up-to-date value that we can get for setting state so if we try this if i now refresh here let's see if this works so now we create this function once and now you can see it is properly updating the count on the page all right number one has to do with fetching and use effect we saw it before but let's talk a little bit more about why you shouldn't do that in the real world so as an example i have a simple post component here and it's just showing us a button and it's keeping track of an id and currently it's set to one and then it's also rendering this post body component so 
So I have another component here where it's using use state for text and it's going to output that text. And then we have a use effect here, which is currently empty. So we have two components here in one file. That's perfectly fine. And what we want to do here is this ID. We want to pass that to the post body. And based on that ID, the post body will fetch some post. So let's pass the ID to post body here. So we can do ID is ID and we get a TypeScript problem. Right, so TypeScript is helping us out. It's telling us that this component right now is not accepting an ID prop. And that's true. So let's actually accept an ID prop. And don't worry, you don't need to know TypeScript for this. But if you have props for a component, you, you do want to type this usually. So we can do that in line. So we could do ID is going to be number. But I always think that this looks a bit clumsy. I like to extract this into its own separate type. Post body props. And let me define that up here. So type post body props is going to be an object with an ID that's going to be a number. So that's the ID. And then based on that ID, we want to fetch a post and display it here, right? So junior developers do this as a quite typical is when you mount a component, you want to fetch some data. And this is the fetch call that we want to make. We're going to make a fetch call to some dummy API based on the ID. So initially ID is one, right? So it's going to be posts one. We get some response. We're going to parse that as JSON, meaning we're going to get JSON as a response and convert that to a normal JavaScript object. And that's what we get here. And then we can just set the text that we actually want to display eventually, right? So bear with me here. So what we're going to do is whenever we click this button, we want to be able to change the ID and then it's going to fetch a new post, right? So here, show me a different post. So let's do that now, right? So when I save here, what happens is this post body will be mounted, right? So it's going to run once because this dependency array is empty. So it's going to run once on mounting. It's going to fetch that based on the ID. The ID right now is one, right? So we get some post here, post text. Okay, so now we want to click on this button and it should change the ID. So on click, I could call it handle click and define that up here but this time i'll do it in line here so here we want to set the id but not to some fixed number like this it should be a random number so in javascript you can say math.random to get a random number between 0 and 1 and we want to do that times 100 so we get a random number between 0 and 100 and this can contain decimals so we're going to round it up or down doesn't really matter you can do math.floor to round it down so that we don't have any decimals so 4.5 will become 4 3.2 becomes 3 all right, so that's not really important. The idea here is that we're just changing the ID to some random number. So now I'm going to click here and what should happen is that it should fetch a new post. So if I click here, let's see, it doesn't work because right now the way that we've done this is use effect. This will only run when the component first mounts because it's an empty dependency array. So here, if the ID changes, right? So here, if the ID becomes 10, let's say ID becomes 10, this component will re-render, but this use effect will not run again because it only run when it's mounted. We can add ID here. So now it will run both when it's mounted, but also every time the ID changes. So now if I save here, now if I click here, you can see every time we get a new post, right? It takes a second or so. So I click now and you can see it takes a second or so before we actually get a post. All right, so, so far so good. All of this is fine if you're just testing something or you're, you're building some very small app. Now in the real world though, if we want to make it more professional, we need to think about the edge cases as well. For example, what if I click multiple times quickly after another here? You can see when I click multiple times, it sort of... Uh, goes through them, flashes through them. If I click three times here, you can see it flashes through them. If I click five times here, it flashes through all of them. Because what happens is every time you click, the ID gets changed and it's going to fire a fetch call. So if you click five times, and so we're going to get five times, it's going to make this fetch call. For all of them, eventually they get some data and they're going to try to set the text. So you're going to get five set text very quickly, one after another. And that's not really the UI experience that we would expect here. If you click multiple times, after another, we don't want to flash through them. We only want to see the last click, basically the last one. So we basically want to cancel previous fetch calls. This is the real world, right? So if you want to become a professional developer, these are the things that you're going to have to think about and solve. So browsers do give us the option to do this ourselves. So what you can have is a so-called new abort controller. So you have a new abort controller and you can pass a second argument here to fetch. It's going to be an object and you can pass a signal here and that's coming from the controller. So controller that signal. So basically we're attaching some signal to this fetch and then we can use that to cancel it. So use effects also has a cleanup function. This function runs whenever you unmount the component, which will not happen here, but it also runs before you go for another round of the use effect. So it allows you to clean up some stuff from the previous run. And that's what we can use here. 
there. So what we can do here, I don't have to go in here. I can also just write it like this. I can use that controller.abort. So now every time this ID changes, and we're going to run this use effect again, right before we do that, we're first going to run this cleanup function, which allows us to abort the previous fetch call. Looks very clumsy, as you can see. But now when I do this and I click multiple times, you can see when I stop clicking, it will just show me the last one. It doesn't flash through them. So if I click twice, it's only going to show one. If I click three times, it's only going to show one, right? So what we saw here, if I remove all of this, what we see here is basically sort of a race condition where the different fetches are basically racing against each other to see which one will set the text first or last. And that's one problem that you're going to have with fetching and use effect. But there are other problems as well, like caching, for example. What if the ID is the same as one that you already fetched before? You're going to make another fetch call and necessarily you, you could cache that and you can reuse the previous result. And if you had some kind of caching solution, we cannot do that like this here. Also, it only fetches after rendering. First, we're going to run all of this. It's going to render this and then it's going to fire use effect, which will then change the text here and it's going to render again, right? So it's basic. it's quite late basically before it can start fetching it. Also, what if you want to do some loading state? We would have to create a new variable here, loading, set loading, and then sort of undo that here, set loading to false. If you have an error with fetching, you would have an error state and you know you have to keep track of that. So if you shouldn't do it in use effect, then how should you fetch data? Well, these days in Next.js, you should try fetching data in server components. So highly recommend you check out my React Next.js course in which we talk about that. And if you want to fetch data on the client in client components, there are libraries like React Query or SWR by Fursell Next.js that will take care of a lot of those issues like caching, race conditions, loading states, error states, and many other things that you will run into in the real world when you start fetching data, right? So I highly recommend you check out my React Next.js course to really become a professional React Next.js developer. Well done for making it this far. This wasn't easy. There were some tricky things. It's okay if you're a little bit confused, but I hope that you learned a thing or two. All of this is going to be very easy if you've picked up the fundamentals. So make sure you master React. And React is very easy to master if you have already mastered JavaScript. And also make sure that you learn CSS properly. I have courses on all of that. Check out the links in the description. Hope that you learned a thing or two. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you soon. Bye.